This episode of The Minimalists is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. Man, I don't even know where to start this one today. Yeah. We're going to talk about addiction. We're going to talk about sex and porn addiction, how to recognize it, how to break it, if it is a thing. Maybe it's not a thing. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I thought we'd bring Lisa Ann to talk about it, though. Yeah. Lisa Ann's here today. Kind of the perfect person to talk about this. Hello, Absolutely. you two. Thanks it for being here. Wonderful to see you both in person. You oh. know what purpose you've put into my life, and I'm so forever grateful for your work. Uh, your documentary started my journey, and then your books, and then action, and it's changed my life. Mm. That is awesome. I love how you say action, because that is the most important part to any journey. Like, you got to take action. You can get all the inspiration in the world, but if you don't take the steps, then yeah, it'll it'll fall flat. You know, we were just talking about that new documentary. It's out, The Social Dilemma. We just did a, a podcast episode with the gal, Jess, who runs our social media. By the way, shout out to Jess. She, she's the one who got Lisa Ann on uh, the cool. show today. And... Um, it really set up the problem, the social dilemma did, and it terrified me in a way, but I don't know whether or not I'm uh, prepared to take the actions necessary to change that. And mm. I, what we're trying to do with minimalism is show people that like there are some steps that you can take to move yourself in the right direction. We're addicted to a lot of things. We're addicted to stuff. We're addicted to drugs and alcohol. And then some people might say that we're addicted to, you know, we hear about sex addiction or we hear about porn addiction. Mm. And I wanted to start with this email that I got from one of our Patreon supporters who, uh, I'll leave his name out because it was a it was a private message, but he says, hey guys, I wanna thank you for all your hard work and the value it's added to my life. I just wanna send a quick note regarding something I've noticed on the podcast over the past couple of years. I've been negatively impacted by pornography in my life. I am in my mid 20s and, and to the best of my memory, I started to experience what I would qualify as an addiction to porn when I was 10 years old. Mm. It, stole from, it stole from my relationships and prevented me from living a meaningful life. The more I've learned about porn, the more I believe that at its nucleus, it is an industry that primarily exists to take advantage of people and leave them in bondage to something they deeply regret. I know many like you, Josh, who speak openly about their enjoyment of porn and what it might be, or what it might add to their sex life. However, I struggle to justify that with my experience and what I have learned porn has taken from so many friends and acquaintances. Mm. To state it plainly, sometimes I feel like your comments surrounding porn are a little cavalier in light of what I understand to be the experience of a significant number of people. To me, participating with the porn industry feels incongruent with loving people and using things. Mm. I truly hope you understand my comments come from a place of genuine love and concern. Um, and so, yeah, he goes on yeah. to sign it there. But Lisa Ann, let, let, let's talk about this because I do believe it can be a problem. Now, I, I've done some research for this episode and it seems to me that there isn't a real agreement as to whether or not it's an addiction. And it certainly is, if it is an addiction, it's it's dissimilar in terms of the brain chemistry from say an alcohol or drug addiction. But let's just say, let, let, we can take that off the table and say, it sounds to me like, like this gentleman here, some people, let's we'll call him Tim, some people like Tim struggle with pornography. So let me ask you how old you are. I'm 39. So he's in his mid twenties, right. which is the ideal age to have this problem. And I'll tell you why, because when you were younger, it was not quite as accessible on your phone. That's right. so true. The problem with adult content, though we have it labeled as 18 and up. I'll mm. give you an example right now. If I went on the street and I sold a DVD to a minor, I would still go to jail for 15 years because mm. you're selling adult content to a minor. Right. But yet any minor can go on the internet and click the green, green box that mm. says he's 18. Yeah. So what I'm finding is from the women I speak to and mentor that are in their, their mid-20s and the men that I speak to in their mid-20s, they had a phone too early, they had access too early, and because of the rush what they were watching created, mm -hmm. the addiction started this chemical balance with them that they couldn't look away from, that they couldn't stop looking at, mm -hmm. and they went down the rabbit hole deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. Now, you probably know what your 
taste is, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what you want to watch. Sure. You're you're not young and just clicking more boxes. You're uh-huh. not going into a category that you know truly you feel the women are disregarded mm-hmm. and maybe disrespected yeah. and maybe there's violence. Oh, you're not going there. But right. a young kid will. If he mm. says at 10, he started watching, yeah. then he went down all of these curiosity rabbit holes. Because think about how curious you are at 10. Oh I'm God. glad content wasn't ex- accessible when I was young. I'm 48. Yeah, me too. You had to go to a store and you had, you're right, they checked your ID. I mean, it was VHS. It was buried in your dad's trunk in a closet. You know, mm-hmm. magazines barely showed anything. Right. Someone his age spent so much time. When he says it robbed him, I get that. Mm-hmm. because it creates expectations mm. of what they would think meeting a girl is going to be like, what she's going to do. And when she doesn't do those things, he's like, Ugh, why would I bother with this? This is a lot of work. I could just go home and watch my porn. Yeah. So now it allowed them to kind of sacrifice real engagement, real interactions, real intimacy. They don't know what real intimacy is. They know that rush they felt starting at 10 years old to watch stuff that they were not old enough to process. Mm. It's awful that we allow young people that type of access mm. because it ruins them for so many years of their life sexually. Yeah. yeah. And, and so let me ask you this. What is the, the solution to that, to the young people be having access to? Obviously, parents, we need to be engaged. Uh, we can't be with them 24 hours a day, though. So it does seem to me like there's some responsibility on the sort of porn hubs of the world to have some sort of ability to, to filter out young kids so i spoke last year at the oxford union on this topic uh because some countries are trying to divide an id card that is like your driver's license Mm -hmm. you would have to scan this in to be able to access the content it would prove how old you are Mm. Uh, some places are trying to do like an eye scan but there are countries that are already ahead of the u.s because Mm. in the u.s this drives traffic and it makes money So we're obviously not going to eliminate it here. Uh But in other countries, they're working towards that. Sweden is working towards that. Mm. England is working towards that because they see it as a problem. In other countries like Finland, Australia, their content is not the same of what we see here. Mm. When my company wants to distribute to some countries... There can't be any violence. There can't be any gagging. There can't be any, like, the angles are different. It's almost soft core Mm. because they know they can't regulate the internet. There should be. You put your ID in there. Mm -hmm. The problem for parents is not checking where their kids have been looking on the internet. You know, Uh. kids will clean the cache, you know, delete their cookies. But, you know, it's also synced in with video games. So when your kid is playing video games, Pornhub is driving traffic to these devices and all of a sudden a window comes down with boobs and the kid clicks on it. Oh my gosh, where am I now? Mm. And now the rabbit hole begins. So we're feeding it and very guilty of it in this country of Mm -hmm. allowing kids to have it. And they're not offering sex education on it in school. Mm -hmm. They're not teaching. Like I try to tell young people, Porn stars are like stunt people. Mm, mm. They're most likely going to do things that a lot of other people will never do. Mm -hmm. So don't expect it in the real world. And also understand that their pay scale graduates up for those types of scenes. So when you meet the girl and take her to the dance, she's most likely not going to do what you saw in the movie. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, the the, the stunts, uh, that's a fascinating way to put it, right? Mm -hmm. Because... um, the truth is you can you can watch and enjoy you know a tom cruise stunt double do or maybe he does some of his own stunts i hear right but regardless you can watch that but when you try to replicate it yourself you often get hurt now mm. i think this is what tim is saying here he's getting hurt sort of metaphorically now ryan he that line that he really said that stood out to me here was to me participating with the porn industry feels incongruent with loving people and using things Hmm. but it doesn't seem to me that it's binary like that that almost sounds like what he's saying is is a little bit too simplistic yeah it's uh, it's porn bad no porn good and that seems to be moralizing it in a way that i don't feel it doesn't feel true to me yeah i guess you know uh, given our topic of minimalism and helping people find balance it's like how do you help someone find balance because yeah it can't just be this binary thing uh you asked, how do you get kids to, or how do you like, you know, monitor kids' internet browsing or whatever it is? You can get, uh, it made me think of 
parental controls. So mm-hmm. like I know on cell phones, like Verizon has this thing where you can, you know, for five bucks a month, you have parental controls. If they go to a website, you can get a notification. Hey, your kid went to this website. Yeah. And we do that with Ella's iPad and, and, yeah. and there, are, there are different apps you can do for that. So I think, you know, when like if, if a parent gets that notification, it's not about like punishing that kid and making them feel bad for it, porn bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also not just doing nothing, you know, porn good. But it's an opportunity to have a conversation about, you know, what pornography is, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. You know, to sit here and say that, you know, it's uh, involving ourselves with the porn industry is uh, the opposite of loving people and using things. And I think that there is some pornography you can get to that when it does have violence, when it has these really, you know, crazy genres that um, totally you know, are, are violent. I don't know how else They're to say unnecessary. it. They're unnecessary. Yes, exactly. They're unnecessary. Yeah, hundred percent. consider that. But it doesn't need to be eliminated because it is like, you know, it's like going out for a decadent dinner or having mm. a decadent dessert. There's people who just like to get decadent and watch something, but they know the content that makes them feel good, whether you're single, whether it's a couple, you know, whatever it is, there's still a lot of good content. It's like sifting through it, just mm. like anything else Mm -hmm. yeah and for him the effect that it had on him very young left him jaded by it because he feels guilty about how it's changed the way he views women and sex and he probably didn't get to have a lot of great sexual experiences on his own Mm -hmm. because they were always led by the thoughts that they're not good enough because they're not what he saw Mm -hmm. for all those years watching it that is such a good point it makes me think of this stat about gen i think it's gen z years they're having the least amount of, least sex, amount of sex than any other. It, and it has to be. The least amount of sex of any generation. And why yeah. is that? Lowest teen pregnancy of any generation. Yeah. Because part of that sounds good, but then my guess is it might be for the wrong reasons though, right? It is not good. It's part of what you saw. Now I'm watching The Social Dilemma tonight. Okay. Uh, my neighbors and I are all getting together because we think this is a good conversation piece where you should watch it and then sit and talk about it afterwards. Yeah. So we're getting together to watch this. Um, it's about what, your what your reason is now i have a lot of young girls that have told me they've had one sexual experience that scared them and now they're not having sex at all that's Mm. the gen xers Mm. and that's from the young guys at 10 watching porn and thinking it's okay to choke a girl the first time they have sex with her and she's Mm -hmm. like what just happened here i'm never doing this again right their phones are more important to them than their vehicles like there was a survey last year would you rather have your parents take your car away for a year or your phone every kid chose their phone because they can use their phone to get an uber Mm. Right, right, right. They yeah. don't want the responsibility of the car. Uh, yeah. The same thing is going on with communication. They can talk with their friends here, but why bother? It's so much work to meet in person. Mm-hmm. And to meet in person means then you have to try. Then you have to engage. Then you have to try and like make that move to hook up. The no sex thing, I think, is very unhealthy. Yeah. 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 And, and to me, like when I say it sounds good, and that's because we're in a, a rather moralizing culture, right, that that puts a premium on. And by, and by the way, we even use weird language around it. I took her virginity. Really? What did you do with it? Right, right, right. 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 Can you right, give right, it? Right. Can I give it to he, someone else? Right, right. right. He took. He yeah. Have, she was a willing participant. Yeah. She shared it with you. Right. And, and by <laughs> the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that she doesn't have it, what, what, what am I able to do something with right. with it? Like we we use this language without even realizing. Like that's a very normal thing for us to use, but it should be abnormal. The way that we w- the way that we talk about sex is often guilty or, or uh, shameful, and we even have a question about that mm-hmm. in, in a little bit. But before we get to our audience questions, let's let's make the sort of case against porn and the case for porn because I think you're the perfect person to talk about both because we see that it's hurt Tim's life here and it's hurt a lot of people's lives probably because of early exposure there are probably other reasons as well but also it exploits certain that that industry can exploit a certain number of people as well so maybe let's talk about the bad side and then maybe we'll talk about the potential upsides of it The bad side, so you know, when I started shooting in the early 90s, there really wasn't a bad side yet. As uh, female performers, you were kind of praised, catered to, craft services called you the day before, what do you want? Mm. You were treated like gold because not a lot of women wanted to do this. So you were still treated like, we don't want her to run off and like move back home. It wasn't, Jenna Jameson didn't arise yet. This didn't become Mm MTV-ish, pop Mm culture-ish. So we were celebrated. Even how the man disrobed you on set had to be very 
very sensual and soft and no mm. rush. It was then illegal to do choking and smacking and mm. anything rough. The girl always had to look equally in control by law uh-huh. to be able to distribute this type of content. Mm. So because the laws were right here, we had no internet. Mm. Everybody stayed on board and it was this really kind of everything was sensual and sexual and it was a bunch of really sexual beings in the industry from in front of the camera to behind the camera and then came the internet and the realization that we need tags we need different tags so that when people put in keywords mm. now we have these tags so now we have to do these 10 extra things in this movie and it just became a thing Mm -hmm. and not um, a beautiful substance of sharing. You could learn something from a porn in the 90s that was intimate, the caressing. I mean, there was like 30 minutes of caressing and foreplay back then Mm -hmm. because the sex was so much shorter and they didn't show full penetration. Mm -hmm. So they had to fill that time. Mm -hmm. The angles were from the side. I mean, and it was this thing. And then here comes the internet. Here comes Gonzo. And it's like, we got to get this much in in 23, 24 minutes. Mm. And we got to cover all these categories. Now we we removed the sexual element of it and made it a total business that would cater to keywords. Mm. How is that sexual? So the Mm. downside with that is that. And then the industry affects the weak when it comes to talent. So the downsides that I saw of men that would hire men that would go into malls by high school and find 18-year-old girls and say, do you want to make $20,000 a month? And of course, the girl that watches the Kardashians every day and everything on each channel, she wants to make $20,000 a month. Sure. She wants to get her hair done, buy clothes. You know, She knows exactly. So the luring in of the uneducated to sign paperwork that then kind of gives away a lot of their rights mm-hmm. and them being so afraid to say no to the money they start making sexual choices. And Mm. I always told everyone, never do something on camera for your first time. Mm. So if you haven't been with a girl on in your personal life, why would you do a girl girl scene on camera? Oh, Mm. what a good point. Like in it's just (laughs) like it any anything, like the first time we did public speaking. I wouldn't want to film that and put it on YouTube. I was 22 years oh. old. It would have been a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> it, but w- it, that's what's happening now. And now also, like, I think there is a, a premium for that as well. The, the, we even call it amateur or whatever, right? Now, now we there, there's something about us that, that gravitates toward, I don't know, maybe it's the, there's a verisimilitude, a, a realness to yes. to. It's to more that. intimate. You're yeah. seeing in. You know, someone isn't telling them what to do. It's just vulnerable. Raw. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And and so when we are consuming some of this material, if it's someone being exploited, we're actually doing uh, uh, harm to. We're doing the opposite, as Tim says here. Yes. Yeah. We're not loving people and using things. We're commodifying people, and that is yeah. the opposite of what Ryan and I want to do. So we have to be careful not to consume something that is taking advantage of other people. And I would say that obviously extends beyond porn. It extends to the clothes that we wear or the food that we eat, right? Yes, Now, but there is a, uh, let's say there's a potential upside to this as well. Um, You talked about in the the 90s where it was a lot more loving in a way. So mm-hmm. let's talk about e- even even today. I think there can potentially be an upside to have a healthy relationship with porn. Yeah, and there's companies now that are working towards those goals of making beautiful quality products. And when couples watch it together, they have something geared towards them. Mm. You know, Wicked is a company that for years has made beautiful products with a little bit of storylines. They kind of remind you of those old Cinemax films where they would <laughs> almost get to sex, but they actually do. Mm. They always use condoms, and that's something they Wicked took upon themselves to promote in their movies, mm. which I think is really important yeah. because it shows that as part of the role. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's about knowing what you're viewing, researching it, and I'm sure you've all heard of OnlyFans and everybody talking about OnlyFans. Yeah. OnlyFans is doing well because all the girls are producing their own content. Right. Yeah. So you know, no something. one is forcing them to do something. Yeah. And it's really been neat to watch them turn into turn away from being workers that often take roles for money that they don't want to do. Mm. And then just going, I want to make cupcakes topless. This is what I want to shoot today. (laughs) And the girl shoots it and has a great time doing it in her own kitchen and then puts it up on her own OnlyFans. Like there's something simple about that. Mm -hmm. But you have to look for couples porn. You have to look for healthy porn and understand that a lot of the stuff you're going to find on say Pornhub, which you brought up, is most likely more graphic Mm. than anyone needs to see. That's Mm -hmm. only here in the U.S. We We should be 
we should really be regulating that a lot more because those are young girls. And I have mm-hmm. a lot of friends who, as they've gotten older and their children have gotten older, they're like, I can't watch porn anymore because now I see girls are like almost my daughter's age. And I'm like, that happens. That's yeah. a normal association. Now you feel a little guilt because you're worried, does this girl at 18 know exactly what she's doing? Mm. Search out couples porn. Search out porn where the performers are a little bit older, the companies are a little bit different. There's some all female run companies that are putting good content out there yeah, but yeah. it is healthy it is an outlet but i think when people are alone and young and watch it 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 forms their mind too much and that's yeah. why the 18 was such an important age like i wish it was 21 to shoot i wish mm-hmm. talent couldn't shoot it before 21 if yeah. i could ever change one thing because a girl from 18 to 21 changes so much that's when you get the tattoo you regret Mm. and then you have to get it removed by 24 (laughs) you know that's when all these little things happen so maybe by 21 she would evolve to to finding more options or maybe she would still say i mean i waited till 21 Mm. even though at 18 i knew i wanted to do it i was just turning 21 when i made my first trips out i was already writing to companies in the business but i just wanted to be sure i wasn't making a permanent decision i was dancing at 18 and meeting porn stars and asking myself for two years is this really going to be my choice? And mm-hmm. it was. Yeah. That's a great point. We've got some audience questions here. We're going to talk a lot more about shame and guilt and, and the upsides and downsides of the struggle with pornography. But let's hop into some of our questions here. First one is from Ari in Boston. I remember that Josh mentioned in the previous episode that it's important to have a partner with a similar sex drive or libido. Even if you have a partner with an aligned sex drive, how can one apply minimalism to either increase or decrease the sex that is going on in your relationship so in the past i think i've mentioned that my wife and i have similar sex drives and that's really good for our relationship i'm certainly not um mapping that onto every relationship i'm sure there are some relationships in which there are radically different sex drives although i think that could probably cause some tension so can we talk about libido's role in a relationship and i think maybe that's leading to all some of these porn problems that we're having where one person may have an appreciably different libido from their partner. Yeah, I think some of it starts from comfort where you become a little bit complacent and then maybe a little bit lazy, right? And then you have to roll that back in and say to yourself, oh, I remember how excited I was when we first moved in together and I knew we could have sex whenever we wanted as opposed to when we went on our date on Friday or Saturday night, right? right? Having those thoughts in your mind and reminding yourself of that excitement and, and kind of finding that way to spark that mm. and connect that without being too intrusive, right? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes someone gets home, they're exhausted, you're not in sync, but one of you is ready and the other isn't. Mm. Setting that stage, how do people set that stage? I tell a lot of my guy friends, if your girl's working late and you're afraid that this might be a night where it doesn't happen, make sure you like tidy up the place before she gets home. Do little things so that when she gets home, her mind has less weight mm. and she is free. And also she's turned on by that. She's mm. excited by that. She was driving home thinking about all these little chores she was gonna have to do, now she doesn't. Right. Now here you are, can be a simple candle, can be, You know, as a wedding gift, I always buy the bride and the groom a cologne and a perfume that I tell them to never wear anywhere except they wear it on their wedding day and then they wear it at home on special, like as a a scent trigger Uh of like, let's get at it tonight. You know what I mean? Don't wear it on a regular thing. Don't wear it on a date to go out to dinner only in your home. Yeah, that's so good. That scent reminds you of that day. Yeah. Well, I think too, like he's he asked, how can minimalism help you have more sex in in, in your relationship? Um, going back to, you know, we're just trying to help people find a middle ground. Yeah. So, uh, help, going to your partner, going to your, uh, wife or husband or whatever and saying, Hey, look, um, here is my values when it is, when it comes to sex, here are my desires. And you start that conversation and see exactly how maybe you two can get on the same page. Now, maybe one partner does have a higher libido than the other. So then the question is, is go out of your, you know, how, how can you go out of your way to show your partner that you want to do everything that you can for them to make them be uh, in, in a sexual mood. I know, like with 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 my partner, like I will um, ask her, you know, hey, wh- what 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 can I do for you? I don't like talking about our sex life too much, like, but yeah. but this is an appropriate time, I guess, to talk about mm-hmm. it. But uh, you know, it'll be something like she'd be like, you know, I really want you to like pick out a nice pair of shorts for me. <laughs> or uh, or or a nice a nice like lingerie thing for me uh-huh. or um hey let's pick out a sex toy together uh-huh. and like those things uh, I pay attention to um, if I didn't ask her I wouldn't know to do that thing 
So, so well, let's talk. Let's talk a bit about libido and and its role in a, a good relationship, a healthy relationship with a partner. Um, I think sometimes. It's one of those weird things where we feel like we can't talk about our desires, even with the people closest to us, or maybe even mm. especially with the people closest to us. And and I think that, that creates some tension in the relationship. If I were to get back to Ari's question here, maybe I, I would say, you know, at least in my own relationship, one thing that has helped us is uh, Bex will often pick a porn for us to watch. Mm -hmm. and, and so it often is the more sensual, sure. uh, woman directed, yep. uh, exactly what you were talking about earlier. And in doing that, it helps me better understand, You know, even though we have similar libidos, we obviously have different preferences. Mm -hmm. And it helps me understand her preferences, what works for her. And then communicating is really key. I can't tell you how many relationships I was in before this relationship. That, I communicated really well in every area except sex. Mm. And I, I'm not sure why that is. Mm. You two probably have a more honest connection and the fact that maybe women in the past felt like they wanted to put a porn on but they didn't know how you would feel about it and then they overthought it and then they just refused to do it, right? Uh -huh. mm. She feels comfortable enough with you. That sets the stage. Mm -hmm. It shows you something different. It's a little bit of like even the bad music in the background of a porno. <laughs> it gets you kind of, it's just like it's, it's a drive thing, right? It's not great music but it gets you there. You might even not even be fully focused watching it. It's just mm. starting it and igniting that. Yeah maybe that conversation they didn't feel comfortable enough having. People are very held back by being open and honest about their libido mm -hmm. and what they want. For you, the little shopping trips, the little details, the tiny things, that's a Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing is not letting it go too long before you have the conversation. You know, yeah. people will say, oh, we haven't had sex in months. Okay, well, at what point did you decide to not go sit outside somewhere at a park and talk about it? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be something you can't talk about, but get yeah. away from all your stuff. I always tie nature in with communication because mm. I think sitting outside can really clear you of all the pressures in your home, your mail, your laundry, your stuff. Go sit outside at a park. Put your phones in the car. Talk about this. Let's yeah. get this ball rolling. That's, you love each other. Yeah. You want to touch each other. You don't want someone else touch you. You don't want to watch porn behind each other's back. Right. right. You want to do this together, so you have to really work at that. Yeah, yeah. I think there was a part in a uh, time in my first marriage mm. where um, – things were just weren't working. We, we, we weren't compatible. She's a great person. It just didn't work out for us. And that did start happening where we weren't watching porn together. It was like, I'm going to watch this when you're not home. Yeah. Uh, Which is a huge failure. Right. Yeah. It, 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 huge failure. Absolutely mm. was. And, and instead of communicating, you know, Dan Savage calls it a former podcast guest of ours. He calls it GGG, good giving and game. When you're in a relationship, you, you want to be you know, good at whatever you're doing or trying to get better at it in order to please the other person. Uh, giving means you're not just receiving. That's often a, a problem, especially many men have is, uh, being the the receiver but never the giver mm. and and then of course game you're willing to do anything within reason sure mm -hmm. right and that's going to be different for each person reason can be way 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 over here for one person and but but being willing to sort of expand those boundaries together i found has really uh, our sex life now we've been together over five years it's way better than it was when it even started and that's the opposite from virtually any relationship i've ever been in. Actually, mm. it's definitely the opposite of any relationship I've been in. Mm. And and so it tends to wane over time in many relationships because you have that chemistry early on, right? There's the early chemistry, but then the rest of the relationship sort of you, you get comfortable and that chemistry. Complacent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so I think if anything, Ari, um, what you're looking for is that, that good giving and game of, helps you avoid that complacency, which is so important. All right, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. There's a chapter in there about how to screw up a relationship. <laughs> it's uh, a, the, the first love of my life. I really screwed up. And, we uh, all did. Right? right? <laughs> and, uh, and I wrote about the yeah. lessons I learned from that. So uh, it's a memoir called Everything That Remains. Uh, Ryan and I wrote it uh, a few years ago. And I feel like our... A podcast you'll like the audiobook version of everything that remains or if you want the book book or the ebook version happy to send those to you as well i'm going to skip uh kalina's question and head right on into the lightning round ryan 
All right. It is time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Those texts go to both of our phones. Mm-hmm. Now, Lisa Ann, during the lightning round, so Ryan and I and our guests, we do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. But not really. We just Twitter re- friendly. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately. Or they expanded it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we monitor on a bit and eventually figure out something that's uh, tweet worthy. Podcast John puts those in the show notes so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media. We call them minimal maxims. Uh, Derek has a question for us. What are your thoughts on the difference between guilt and shame being a primary trigger to lead someone to become addicted to porn? You know, I think it's really fascinating. And I have a, a article that we're going to talk about on the maximal episode. Um, because I do think that part of what's going on right now with the the shame and, and guilt around sexuality and, and thus to porn has to do with we've been acculturated to be ashamed of our bodies, of sex, mm-hmm. of sexual expression, right? How did you get over that? Because especially with the time when you started, it was a giant leap for you to have to make. And did you ever struggle with guilt or shame at all before or after? Um, I struggle with everyone else's. You know, everyone else's guilt and shame was projected on me to mm. the point where wow. I can't tell you how many apartments I was denied access, oh. uh, banks I was denied service. You know, in the late 80s, early 90s, as a girl in this industry taking money into a bank, there were women that would just not deal with you. They would just send you out. So I dealt with not feeling it myself because to me, this was my choice. I used to tell people like, you're letting this bother you and this doesn't bother me. I'm a sexual being. I had three very simple goals at 16, which was to travel and see the world, make my own money and make my own schedule. Mm. Adult life porn fulfilled that for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I got to see the world. So the guilt for me is only when someone projects it on me. You know, like sometimes I can remember in my dating life, like I'd go on a date with somebody, I think they'd be really into me. And then I realized like, oh, they want me to explain to them how I deal with my guilt. And I don't have any guilt, which they're going to be bothered by Mm because they have a ton of guilt. Mm -hmm, And they need me to pacify them so that they can consider dating me. Because really, they just wanted to see what it would be like. And now that they think they kind of like me, they don't know how to process the information. Right, mm. it's a very select person to process the information. We shouldn't be ashamed of our bodies. I have a much more European mindset, whereas they're so open in other countries. Mm-hmm. We're so held off. That's why porn makes so much money because mm. if we make people think it's it's bad, then they want it more, like drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, it's not my guilt. I mean, I've been, I've had, especially during the pandemic when the world was closed, I sat down with myself and said, "How glad are you?" that you took every fucking chance you could. Mm. Here we are sitting locked in our places. I have no regrets. Yeah. If it's sex with people in other countries that never spoke English. I, I worked in <laughs> on sets in, in a whole room of people that spoke different languages and mm. our only common language was sex. Uh-huh. Mm. And I feel so liberated by these choices that I made and these chances that I took. So people have to understand that you're the guard of your own thoughts when it comes to shame and guilt. Mm-hmm. Mm. Criminals feel shame and guilt, right? They're sitting in a cell and they have to sit and think about what horrible things they did that got them there, which Mm. is awful. Sexually, you shouldn't feel shame or guilt. Let's talk about shame versus guilt here. Mm. Uh, Let's have a quick pithy answer and then we'll unpack it here. Guilt tells us something about our actions, but shame says something about our identity. So ultimately, if we do something, like you said, as a criminal, you might do something once that doesn't make you that person. No. You you made a a mistake or a bad decision, Mm -hmm. depending on, those those are two different things, but maybe you made a a bad decision. That doesn't mean that's who you are as a person. But if you're that person who continues to rob bank after bank after bank, you're probably a bank robber. Yeah. Right? You're that person. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And, And so ultimately you're going to feel shame because that's who I've become. I've become this person. Well, guess what? How do you change that shame? It's by stop doing the actions that created the guilt that ultimately created the the shame. Yeah. And, and now, but what we're talking about here is not a specific action. Sex isn't the thing that we should feel guilty about. Humans have always done it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> are we are we going to act like that's not something that's it's been right. happening for 200,000 years uh, plus uh, in, in humanity? And, and so that's not the thing to feel guilty about. What we feel guilty about is this 
this moralizing that has happened in our society. And Ryan and I, we, we have different beliefs. We have similar values, though. So we bring a lot of different people on the podcast. The first time you were scheduled to be on here, uh, there were some COVID-related things. You weren't able to make it. We had a, uh, a pastor on that same day instead, <laughs> right? And that was a swap out. What a swap out. I even, told, I even told him that. His name's Erwin McManus. And, uh, but he's a different kind of pastor who isn't a moralizing sort of person. In fact, the, the church that he started, he didn't let Christians come to it for the first couple years. Because they're, <laughs> they're too judgmental. Because they're too judgmental. He was afraid. He was because he he himself is a Christian. He was, he was afraid that Christians were going to ruin his his sort of Christianity in a way. Because mm. he was he didn't want to be judgmental. He wanted to create this thing for people who he wanted to create, create a space of openness. Mm. And I think that's what we're talking about right now. When we're talking about whether it's it's porn or we're talking about any of our other proclivities. Um, we need the space to, to even talk about these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even a conversation like what we're having right now can be incredibly taboo for some people because because of the guilt that they're that they are feeling. Yeah. Mm. And it doesn't mean that you have done something wrong necessarily. It means that you're told the thing that you want is wrong, mm. that your desire is wrong, that your human tendencies are wrong. But I don't think that gets us very far. No. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting because growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, they are, kids are getting married at 17, 18 years old because they're not allowed to have sex before marriage. So they don't want to live in sin. So they end up getting married. And I can't tell you how many of them end in divorce or worse, they're still married and can't stand each other. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is so important to question why we feel guilty. In fact, my, my pithy answer is this, uh, learning from your guilt can help you avoid shame. So if you watch porn and you feel guilty, that is a symptom of something. And you've got to ask yourself, why do I feel guilty? Is it because I'm told I should feel guilty? Is it because I had this sexual experience without my partner? Mm-hmm. I mean, to examine why you feel guilty, that's really what's going to help you move forward. And then you learn from that guilt. Either you learn something about uh, your morals or you learn something about, uh, you, you'll learn something about yourself. If you don't learn from your guilt, then you will get to a point where you start to be ashamed of who you are. So the bank robber who's robbing multiple banks eventually is going to be like, well, I'm a bank robber, so that's what I'm going to do. Sure, yeah. accepted it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they, yeah, they, they reconcile with, okay, I have to become, now I am this person. I've become the sort of the, the bad guy. I love what you're saying here, Ryan, about, about guilt because, well, I think in, uh, where was I going to go with this? Um, the, <laughs> There's so many ways to go with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so if, if someone is feeling guilt because the society has propped them up some, some way, we call it a, a mimetic belief, right? It, it just means that society has said something is, is wrong or taboo. And, and we may not feel that intrinsically that something is, is, is wrong or taboo. And so there is this cognitive dissidence. Mm. Now, Lisa Ann, you were able to avoid that cognitive dissidence in yeah. a way. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, how you, I know you, you mentor younger, I would call them kids now, but people yeah, in their they're, 20s. They're, they're, they right? could be my children. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And many of them come to me because they can have conversations with me that they just don't feel comfortable having with their parents uh-huh. or friends their age. I love having younger friends because younger people keep you so inspired. I mean, their level of movement now, they're so creative. Every young kid knows how to edit, create, do Uh everything from a laptop. Like you could take them to another country and they'll put you out 10 YouTube videos. You know what I mean? Like (laughs) the things they know how to do. But yet they haven't had those conversations with their parents. Uh, They're very intimidated by porn. You know, think about being a young woman and trying to watch porn for your first time. It's much more geared towards men than it was when I started in the 90s. There's not a lot there for them. Then it makes them afraid. Oh, are these things going to happen to me when I go to have sex with a guy? Yeah. So I'll tell young Mm. people, for every one porno scene you watch, I want you to read a romance novel. Because when I grew up, Mm. all of my aunts read these romance novels. And so eventually I took one and I realized, oh my gosh, this is reading porn. Yeah, they're oh, pretty steamy. They're so steamy. They're <laughs> yeah. so steamy. And yet, but yet they get the juices flowing, right? Uh-huh. But then there's a cliff because, you know, you have to visualize your own sex scene. Uh-huh. But see, that's a really good thing for a young woman. 
Because if you take that next step and you visualize a sex scene, you're almost creating what you think turns you on. You're visualizing what this man would look like, Mm -hmm. how he would touch you Mm -hmm. as you're reading this. So I think we need to kind of roll it back. That's a really good sex education is playing the mental game with yourself, getting your heart racing a little bit and feeling it rather than they just go to it. I mean, there's so much kissing talk in those romance novels. I was young. I was like 10. I was like, why do my aunts read these things? Like cover to cover. Mm. Uh And then I got it. We don't offer that in porn right now. So I think Mm. for me, teaching young people to roll it back, to be limiting what they're watching, but also to trust each other and to want to touch and see how it feels. You know, when I was younger, we were a little bit freer. We would have more experimental sex. We would talk during it. Mm, you know, we weren't mm-hmm. as held back. I think this generation is a bit more scared to do that because they're afraid it will get out on social media. Somebody might take a photo. Oh. Somebody might tell a friend, mm. oh, I was with him and he couldn't get it up. Uh-huh. They're so afraid of their peers. Yeah. Now. Mm. We didn't have that. Who was going to tell? Yeah. And if they did, who was going to believe them? Right. But back then, people didn't speak about it, gossip about it. They respected it. Yeah. This this enhances mm-hmm. the sort of guilt, right? What you were talking about earlier, like if you feel if you watch porn and then you feel guilty from it, um, that that may be the case. But the guilt could stem from several reasons. Sometimes the guilt might be justified. Like yeah. when I talked about earlier, my first marriage. I should feel guilt for that because what I was doing was hiding something. Not that I was watching porn. It wasn't the porn that was the problem in, in that relationship. Right. It was me and it was our compatibility that was a problem in that relationship. And so I felt guilty, not because of watching the porn, and this is just in retrospect, but I felt guilty because I was hiding something from someone that I loved. And you weren't sharing your needs with that person either. You were handling Mm. them on your own. You felt very selfish guilt about that too. Mm, Absolutely. Because now you knew she wasn't going to get taken care of either. So in the back of your mind, you had guilt about that as well. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and so when I, when I finally came to terms with like, Hey, it, maybe it's not the porn that is the problem here. At least in that relationship, it was, a lack of communication, a a unwillingness to be myself with the person who's closest to me. And I was putting up a a sort of facade, right? And so I think that, and then eventually the shame came in because like, well, I guess I'm the type of person who goes and like hides in his office and Mm. masturbates to porn instead of having a difficult conversation with my wife. That's, that is a problem. And that's when porn becomes a problem. But then now in my marriage now, it is, It's sort of an augmentation. It's an amplification. It's not a crutch. We don't use it regularly, but when it, it, if even if we did, that'd be fine. But what happens is we use it when it's when it feels appropriate. And decadent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love you know I loved I loved when I was on the road and I'd be at strip clubs and there'd be couples that would come in once a month. They would go out for like a nice dinner and then they'd go to the strip club together. And it was just their thing they did once a month. And some of them were really just people watchers, right? But it was something they shared that was so unique. And it just made me happy in the late 90s when I started to see couples evolving. You know, when I started, the owners didn't let women into clubs. So even if you were a couple, the owners back then would say, well, these women will take away from my women making money and there'll be fights over these women. I'm like, no, these are couples (laughs) that want to come in and do this together and maybe share in a dance and talk about what they like in a girl. And then, of Mm. course, you know, they went home and had great sex. Uh Right. And finally, this started to evolve and it made me very happy because I would see couples and the girls would always treat them really well, too, because the girls were like, this is so cool. You guys are doing this together. And. It was, it was their thing, just like you guys watching something together. It was just kicking it up a little notch together. Yeah. So, so if we were to sum this up, would we say that porn is a problem when it, when you become dependent on it? Just like, or and or when it gets in the way of living meaningfully. And, and that, I think you could, sub, you could substitute porn with alcohol you know, because it's not inherently evil, mm-hmm. right? Um, you can substitute it with work. There are workaholics yeah. where that des- destroys their life, right? But no one's saying, well, I guess we should stop working now Mm -hmm. because uh, one guy happens to be addicted to working. No, what we need to say is there's a responsible amount that we need to figure out that's appropriate for our own lives. And so the bad seems to happen when it gets in the way or we become dependent on it. Mm-hmm. The, the good happens when it enhances, amplifies our experience of life. I also think the bad happens when you are too young. Mm-hmm. Age plays a huge role in this. I mean, under yeah. 18, haven't had any of your, imagine your first experience 
is with a porn and not with an, an, a, a girl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think it's age, when it came into your life, and then how much free time you had to watch it. I think it being accessible on phones is really creating havoc, and that's why when he said mid-20s, I was like, bing, 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 I know exactly what his problem is. Yeah. He was locked in his room watching it for endless hours a day for probably five, ten years. Yeah, and yeah. that creates an unhealthy relationship with other people because they're not actually uh, you you're not you're not seeing them necessarily as other people at that point right and you're not engaging no you're not you're not engaging with other people you're not right. going out flirting with girls you're just sitting and watching something that can be really destructing and really disturbing yeah and it can yeah. it can ruin you in a lot of ways uh, another thing dan savage often says he talks about death grip syndrome i was just thinking that yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean i don't know if you're familiar with this but basically it's you know guys who masturbate so frequently they're they're unable to you know just get off with it with another partner yeah. uh and, and i think that what's happening is your, your mind all of a sudden now associates associates horniness or attraction with that glowing screen mm. as opposed to that other human being who and is remember, in your life. remember, the stunt people that are acting like they're enjoying it more than they actually are. That mm. it is shot with a fisheye lens that makes the guy look larger than oh. he actually is. Mm. Right. Where there's tons of lubricants to make the girl look wet. Like everything mm. about it is amplified like a stunt movie. Like a stunt so... It's such an unrealistic, you know, when I did my speech at Oxford Union, I said 99% of what you saw on the internet, don't ever ask a girl to do any of that for Mm. you. You know, it's not going to happen and you're most likely going to offend her and freak her out. So reel it in, reel it in. But there's so much they see. And I think too young is very destructive. Yeah. All right. We want to talk about kinks coming up. Kinks, kink shaming. Uh, Are certain kinks appropriate, inappropriate? Mm. Before we get into that, we also have some listener tips and an added value segment today, but we do have a bunch of surprise questions this week, like, are minimalists less susceptible to porn addiction? Will our youth become more addicted to porn with the easier access of today? Also, what's porn look like in the future? What's responsible porn look like in the future? Can appropriate porn viewing actually help someone's sex life? Will addressing trauma and sexual trauma help break some of our addictions? Also, is pleasure inherently immoral? Plus a million more questions for Lisa Ann and The Minimalist. And if you want to hear all that, subscribe to our Maximal episode over on The Minimalist Private Podcast. It's a completely separate podcast, and it's the most honest way for The Minimalist to earn an income because we don't believe in advertisements. By the way, if you're not a private podcast supporter, you're literally missing two-thirds of our show. So go ahead and try it out for a month if you don't get immense value from it. You can always walk away. You can set it down if it's not adding value to your life. But it's worth way more than the $2 that we charge. Head on over to theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe and get a personal link so that our maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hi, my name is Naz from uh, Cypress, California, and um, I do have a tip um, for all of your clothes and your shoes that you aren't in need of right now. Um, I'm not sure if hospitals are accepting it because of COVID, but um, as a nurse, I know that when I discharge a lot of homeless patients, um, we can't discharge them in the clothes that they came in with, you know, either they're dirty or, you know, um, it's just uh, season-wise, it's just colder, and they don't have um, thick, warm clothing. So um, if you are able to find a hospital that is accepting donations, then that would be the best place since a lot of hospitals, um, we can't really discharge patient, patients in gowns, um, and we don't really have a lot of shoes, so that would be the best thing. Hi, Josh and Ryan. My name is Parker, and I'm from Ventura, California. I just wanted to offer up a really cool resource for anyone who is a free-thinking individual and wants to become more politically involved. I myself find it nearly impossible to truly understand and take a stance on certain political issues with the amount of polarizing news and media that supports the narrative there really is only the right side or the left side. The organization I want to share is called Braver Angels, and it is a group that seeks to make politics in the United States less polarized through thoughtful discussion and debate. It holds formal debates where people can deliver speeches on extremely prevalent issues. There are time limits and questions as well as alternating positions throughout the whole debate. It is a truly refreshing and hopeful way to experience politics. So I highly recommend it. 
All right, y'all. Thanks again to Lisa Ann for joining us today. Check out her podcast. It's called The Lisa Ann Experience. If you want to follow her on Twitter and Instagram, she's at the real Lisa Ann. And she also has a YouTube channel at the real Lisa Ann as well. We'll put a link to those in the show notes. Thanks again, Lisa Ann, for joining us today. Yeah. Helping us have a meaningful conversation. Speaking of meaningful conversations, for our added value this week, Ryan, we already alluded to him earlier, but we might as well talk about it. One of my favorite podcasts is the Savage Love Cast. Dan oh, yeah. Savage. Yeah former podcast guest of, of ours, um, not in studio, but we were doing some of the quarantine conversations and we were able to capture that uh, with him. Had a great conversation with him. But he, I mean, part of our podcast, we, we, we take voicemails from people. I originally got that idea as a mix between Dan Savage and um, Dave Ramsey. Mm. And, and, and our show is obviously different from both of theirs, mm -hmm. but... I think the key is we try to help people out in different realms with with Dave Ramsey, it's money. With Dan Savage, it's uh, sex and relationship mm -hmm. advice. And his his podcast, the Savage Love Cast, is so, I mean, Bex and I will often listen to it and we'll say, how do you think he's going to answer this question? Mm -hmm. How do you think he's going to answer this question? I, I subscribe to the ad-free version of his um, and, and because he has a, an ad version and a longer extended ad free version and it's totally worth it to get it completely ad free but uh, even if you don't if you want to check out his podcast I would just download the most recent episode it, they're not themed they're just numbered so it's like number 716 or whatever you just go to the most recent episode and and check it out listen to him answering some questions and you'll realize that oh there's a totally different worldview and mm. many different worldviews about sexuality mm -hmm. and uh, about um, shaming and not feeling shame with respect to our sexuality and having a healthy relationship with intimacy. Mm. And, and man, it's just a great podcast, The Savage Lovecast. I would encourage you to check it out uh, real quick for Right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. Ryan has finally started an OnlyFans account. <laughs> For only $50 a month, you, you can see a bunch of pictures of cucumbers. <laughs> You'll see why they call him the Greek freak. <laughs> that is not true. No, we, uh, there is no OnlyFans account. Although, shout out to you if you have one. Right. Uh, Ryan has decided he hasn't pulled the trigger on that just yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so instead of going to Ryan's uh, fictitious OnlyFans account, uh, one thing I'm going to recommend for you is we're talking about shame today. We're talking about our values, really. Uh, I think it's about getting clear on what your values are. A lot of the things that we've, we've discussed today, uh, questions that we're answering, they really have to do something with our, our values. And you can't really act in accordance with your values if you don't know what they are and so we have a free values worksheet and an essay that you can read and in fact in that essay i even go through my values we, we have identified four different types of values it's like building a house you got to have a foundation you, then you have to have a, the structure so you have foundational values structural values surface values and imaginary values and i, I think Quite often, the imaginary values are the things we think are important, mm. but they're not actually important at all. Yeah. And unfortunately, we waste so much time on those imaginary values, and they get in the way of what's actually important. So we want to help you identify what your values are, which fake values are getting in the way, and you can download that worksheet for free. You can just fill it out. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautifully designed worksheet. Our friends over at Spire designed it for us. And read the essay as well, theminimalists.com slash V to check out how to understand your values, the essay there, and also download that free values worksheet. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at The Minimalists. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, Sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails whenever we send those. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. 
Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it